Story 7. Lullaby by Leslie Marmon Silco Characters Aya, the elderly protagonist of the story. She is a Native American woman who reflects on her past, memories of her children, and the impact of colonialism on her life. Jimmy, Aya's son who is presumed dead after a helicopter crash. His absence is a source of sorrow for Aya. Chato, Aya's husband, who is mentioned in the story. He is a Native American man who plays a significant role in Aya's life. Danny, Aya's son, who is taken away by white doctors along with his sister Ella. Aya reflects on the day they were separated from her. Ella, Aya's daughter, who is also taken away by white doctors along with Danny. Aya remembers the events surrounding their separation. Summary Leslie Marmon Silco, born in 1948, is a Native American writer known for her novels like Ceremony and The Almanac of the Dead. Raised in the Laguna Pueblo community of New Mexico, she draws on her cultural background in her works. In her story A Lullaby, Silco explores the clash between Native American and white cultures, highlighting the enduring impact of colonialism on Native Americans. The story ends with a poignant lullaby, symbolizing the persistence of memory and culture despite oppression. Aya, an elderly woman, reminisces about her past while sitting under a cartonwood tree in the snow. She recalls how she used to play with snow like her own children. Now, her life is filled with memories. Aya gazes at the snowy landscape, finding solace in the familiar Navajo song carried by the wind. She sits by Sebaleta Creek, where cows graze in spring. Wrapping herself in an old army blanket from her son Jimmy, she avoids dwelling on him. Instead, she reflects on her mother's weaving, vividly recalling the loom under a tamarack tree and the combs used to prepare wool. Her mother's vibrant yarns come to life on the loom. Aya recalls her mother's skill in dyeing yarn for blankets, crafted to repel rain like birds' feathers. She cherishes memories of warmth on cold nights in the Hogan, wrapped in those blankets. As the snow swirls around her, Aya reminisces about wearing elk hide moccasins before overshoes were available. She finds comfort in these recollections, no longer feeling the cold. Jimmy's blanket holds newfound warmth, evoking memories of his birth. He never returned, presumed dead in a helicopter crash. The military informed them, but Chato, fluent in English and Spanish, declined any return of Jimmy's remains. Aya mourns, facing hardship without him. Aya mourns Jimmy, envisioning him working on the ranch. She recalls the day white doctors came to take Danny and Ella, gesturing and pressuring her to sign papers. Fearing for her children, Aya grabs them and flees to the foothills, leaving the doctors behind. In the calm of the hills, Aya finds solace under the blue sky. Danny plays with pebbles, while Ella drops dirt in the breeze. They watch a hawk circle above. As evening approaches, Aya looks down at their worn shack, deciding to wait for her husband, keeping the children safe from the white men who pursued them. Aya regrets signing the papers that led to the loss of her children. Children When the doctors return with a BIA policeman, Chato informs her it's too late to change anything. She mourns the separation, feeling the pain grow with each reminder of their last day together. Aya resents Chato for teaching her to sign her name, believing it made her vulnerable. She isolates herself on the hill, where she eventually creates a bed where the children used to sleep. Only years later, when Chato falls ill, does she embrace him again. She heads back to find him in the snow, reflecting on their strained relationship. Aya struggles through the deep snow to the bar, hoping to find Chato waiting for her. Inside, the hostile atmosphere is palpable. The patrons stare at her, wary of the old Navajo woman. Aya examines every corner, searching for Chato. The bartender gestures for her to close the door, but she doesn't notice. Drying her snow-covered blanket by the stove, memories flood her mind. She recalls the first time her children were returned by white strangers, feeling a disconnect. They left after a few hours, unable to comprehend Aya's way of life. The last visit was in June, and Aya sensed they wouldn't return. She turned away without saying goodbye. 
Aya searches for Chato, determined to find him. She believes that with the blanket, they can take shelter in the old adobe barn near the arroyo. She hopes the money and wine are gone, signaling their return to their humble hogan with its dirt roof and rock walls. The years have been tough, the garden struggling due to a lack of rain. They rely on welfare provisions, making monthly trips to Sebaleta for their check. Aya finds Chato walking slowly along the road, noticing his frailty and the scent of wood smoke and urine on him. He sometimes confuses her with his sister, who passed away long ago. Chato gazes at her, as if seeing her for the first time, before they continue their journey in the falling snow. Aya and Chato find shelter among giant boulders, escaping the passing storm. They share the blanket, wrapped together against the cold. As the clouds clear, Aya marvels at the crystalline night sky, unobstructed by haze. Chato lies beside her, looking youthful in the moonlight. Aya senses the freezing cold descending from the thin moon, knowing he'll be insulated by the wine-induced sleep. She tucks the blanket around him, reminiscing about caring for Ella and feeling a surge of love. She sings a familiar lullaby passed down through generations, a comforting and tender gesture towards her children. A. Multiple choice questions. 1. Etymologically, lullaby means A. A. Love song. B. Sleep song. C. Parody. D. War song. 2. Chato is Ayas. A. Friend. B. Son. C. Brother. D. Husband. 3. Was the name of Aya's son, who was killed in war. A. Jimmy. B. Tammy. C. Rumi. D. Sunny. 4. In addition to his native language Chato spoke, language 2 English. A. Spanish. B. French. C. German. D. Hindi. 5. Who were Danny and Ella? A. Aya's siblings. B. Aya's children. C. Aya's friends. D. Police officers. Extra MCQs. 1. What is Leslie Marmon Silco known for? A. Painting. B. Writing. C. Sculpting. D. Singing. 2. Where was Leslie Marmon Silco raised? A. New York City. B. Los Angeles. C. Laguna Pueblo, New Mexico. D. Chicago. 3. In which story does Silco explore the clash between Native American and white cultures? A. Ceremony. B. The Almanac of the Dead. C. Lullaby. D. Gardens in the Dunes. 4. What does the lullaby at the end of the story symbolize? A. Joy and celebration. B. The persistence of memory and culture. C. Sadness and loss. D. A farewell to the past. 5. Where does Aya sit while reminiscing about her past? A. Under a cottonwood tree. B. In a bar. C. Near Sebaleta Creek. D. In an old adobe barn. 6. What does Aya wrap herself in for warmth? A. A military uniform. B. A Navajo blanket. C. A shawl made of elk hide. D. A red shirt. 7. How does Aya describe the clouds in the sky? A. Dark and ominous. B. Massive and full. C. Wispy and scattered. D. Absent and clear. 8. What is Aya's son's name? A. Danny. B. Jimmy. C. Chato. D. Ella. 9. What does Aya recall about her mother's weaving? A. It took place under a cottonwood tree. B. Her mother used a wooden loom. C. The combs, the combs were made of metal. D. The yarns were dyed green and blue. 
10. What did Aya's mother use to dye the yarn for blankets? A. B. Weed petals. B. Juniper berries. C. Sage. D. All of the above. 11. Where does Aya find shelter during the storm? A. In a cave. B. Among giant boulders. C. In a bar. D. Under a cottonwood tree. 12. What does Aya notice about the sky after the storm? A. It is full of stars. B. It is covered in clouds. C. It is red from the setting sun. D. It is hazy with mist. 13. What does Aya see descending from the thin moon? A. Rain. B. Icy stillness. C. Shooting stars. D. Birds flying. 14. How does Aya feel about the cold? A. She enjoys it. B. She doesn't feel it. C. She finds it unbearable. D. She is indifferent to it. 15. What does Aya do with the blanket to keep Chato warm? A. Wraps it around herself. B. Tucks it around him. C. Throws it in the air. D. Sings a lullaby to it. 16. Why does Aya feel anger towards Chato? A. He taught her to sign her name. B. He took her children away. C. He abandoned her in the hills. D. He drank all the wine. 17. What is the significance of Aya's white hair and wrinkled face? A. It indicates her age and wisdom. B. It symbolizes her grief and loss. C. It represents her connection to nature. D. It suggests her strength and resilience. 18. Why does Aya go to the bar in Sebaleta? A. To find her children. B. To meet with friends. C. To get supplies. D. To look for Chato. 19. How does Aya feel about the people in the bar? A. She is afraid of them. B. She is comfortable around them. C. She is indifferent to them. D. She is angry with them. 20. What does Aya hope to find when she returns to the shack? A. Her children. B. Food and supplies. C. Chato waiting for her. D. A warm fire. 21. What does Chato's sister's passing have to do with Aya and Chato? A. They were close friends with her. B. Chato often confuses Aya with her. C. Aya is actually Chato's sister. D. Chato feels guilty about her death. 22. What is Aya's reaction when she finds Chato in the snow? A. She is rel relieved. B. She is angry. C. She is sad. D. She is indifferent. 23. How does Chato appear in the moonlight? A. Young and vibrant. B. Old and frail. C. Angry and agitated. D. Frightened and disoriented. 24. What does Aya do to protect Chato from the cold? A. She builds a fire. B. She wraps him in a blanket. C. She sings a lullaby. D. She brings him inside the bar. 25. What is the central theme of a lullaby by Leslie Marmon Silco? A. The enduring impact of colonialism. B. The beauty of nature. C. The power of memory. D. The importance of family. B. Short questions. 1. How does the author describe the condition of the weather and the condition of the old woman at the beginning of the story? At the beginning of the story, the author, Leslie Marmon Silco, vividly describes the wintry setting and the condition of the old woman, Aya. The sun has set, casting the landscape into darkness, yet the snow in the wind emits its own eerie light, creating an otherworldly atmosphere. The snow falls in thick tufts, resembling freshly washed wool waiting to be spun by a weaver. This imagery evokes a sense of purity and transformation. As for Aya, she is portrayed as an elderly woman, her age reflected in her reminiscences and reflections on her past. 
She sits under a cottonwood tree, a symbol of endurance and wisdom in Native American culture. The rough bark of the tree presses against her back, emphasizing her connection to the natural world. Despite her age, Aya reaches out to the snow, much like she did with her own children, demonstrating a lingering vitality within her. Aya's thoughts drift, drift to her youth, remembering moments of joy and laughter with her children. However, now she is described as an old woman, her life dominated by memories. The language used to describe Aya's physical state is evocative of her weathered condition. The portrayal of Aya against the backdrop of the snowy landscape sets the stage for a narrative that will delve into themes of memory, loss, and the enduring spirit of Native American culture. 2. Narrate the scene that Aya remembers with her mother and grandmother. Aya reminisces about a cherished memory with her mother and grandmother, a scene steeped in the artistry of traditional Navajo weaving. In her recollection, Aya envisions herself as a little girl, entrusted with the task of preparing raw wool. The setting is a familiar one, under the shade of a tamarack tree where a tall wooden loom stands, ready to bring their creations to life. Aya's grandmother sits beside her, her hand skillfully manipulating a smooth cedar spindle, spinning strands of silvery yarn. As Aya combs the freshly washed wool, she feels a deep sense of connection with the generations before her. The act of preparing the wool becomes a ritual, a passing down of knowledge and tradition. The air is infused with the earthy scent of the wool, and the atmosphere is one of purposeful industry. Aya's mother, too, is engrossed in the process, working the loom with brightly dyed yarns in shades of yellow, red, and gold. The colors reflect the vibrancy of their culture, each thread a testament to their heritage. In this sacred space, surrounded by the tools of their craft and the natural beauty of their surroundings, Aya learns not only the practical skills of weaving, weaving, but also absorbs the intangible essence of her cultural identity. The memory is a testament to the profound significance of their craft, a tradition that binds generations together in a continuum of artistry and heritage. 3. How did native people protect themselves from the snow in the past? In the past, native people employed various ingenious methods to protect themselves from the harsh winter elements, particularly snow. One of the primary strategies was the construction of sturdy, insulated dwellings designed to withstand cold temperatures. For instance, the Navajo people, like Aya in the story, built traditional hogans with thick walls made of logs and mud. These structures provided effective insulation against the cold and snow, offering a warm and secure shelter. Additionally, native communities often utilized natural resources to create protective clothing and footwear. Animal hides and furs, such as those from deer or elk, were skillfully fashioned into clothing items like coats, moccasins, and leggings. These garments not only provided warmth, but were also designed to repel moisture from the snow, keeping the wearer dry. In regions with heavy snowfall, snow shelters were sometimes constructed. For example, the Inuit people built snow igloos, using blocks of compacted snow to create domed structures. These igloos offered excellent insulation and protection against the cold, allowing inhabitants to stay warm even in frigid conditions. Furthermore, native people often relied on their knowledge of the land and natural resources to sustain themselves during the winter. They engaged in practices such as hunting, gathering, and storing food to ensure a steady supply of sustenance throughout the colder months. By combining architecture, architectural ingenuity, resourceful clothing, and strategic use of natural resources, native communities devised effective methods to protect themselves from the challenges posed by winter, including heavy snowfall. 4. Why Aya's son was named Jimmy Aya's son was named Jimmy as a way of bridging the gap between his Navajo heritage and the English-speaking world he would be raised in. In the story, Lullaby, by Leslie Marmon Silco, Jimmy is given a name that honors both his Navajo roots and the English language, which would be a significant part of his identity growing up. In Navajo culture, names often carry deep significance and can be influenced by various factors, including the circumstances of a child's birth or events occurring around that time. When Jimmy was born, it was on a summer morning, and this natural event inspired his name. In English, he was formally named Jimmy, a name that would allow him to navigate the predominantly English-speaking society he would grow up in. By giving him a name that straddles both cultures, Aya, 
and her family likely hoped to prepare Jimmy for the challenges of living in a world where his Native American heritage coexists with English-speaking communities. This decision reflects the complex cultural dynamics that many indigenous families face, as they seek to preserve their traditions while also equipping their children to thrive in a predominantly English-speaking society. 5. Where and how was Jimmy killed? Jimmy was killed in a helicopter crash during his service in the military. The story, Lullaby, by Leslie Marmon Silco does not provide extensive details about the exact circumstances of the crash, but it is mentioned that the helicopter he was on caught fire and burned up after it crashed. This tragic event occurred while Jimmy was serving in the military, which implies that he was likely stationed in an area where helicopters were being used, possibly in a combat or training capacity. The story does not specify the location of the crash or the specific mission Jimmy was on at the time. However, it is clear that his untimely death had a profound impact on Aya and her family. The military officer who informed them of Jimmy's death mentioned that they would try to recover his body, but due to the extent of the fire, it was unlikely they would be successful. Jimmy's death serves as a pivotal and tragic event in the story, highlighting the sacrifices and losses experienced by Native American families, particularly those with members in the military. It also adds to the theme of the enduring impact of colonialism and the hardships faced by Aya and her family. 6. Why are Aya's children taken away from her by the doctors? Aya's children, Danny and Ella, are taken away from her by the doctors because they believe the children have contracted tuberculosis, a highly contagious and potentially deadly respiratory disease. The doctors are concerned about the spread of the disease and want to isolate and treat the children in a medical facility. In the story, Lullaby, by Leslie Marmon Silco, the doctors are accompanied by a BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, policeman who assists them in their efforts to take the children. They approach Aya and pressure her to sign papers, likely consenting to the children's removal for medical treatment. Aya, who does not fully understand the language and customs of the white doctors, becomes frightened and anxious about the fate of her children. Fearing for Danny and in Ella's safety, Aya takes matters into her own hands. She grabs the children and flees to the foothills, seeking refuge from the doctors and the policemen. Her actions are driven by a mother's instinct to protect her children, even if it means defying the authority of the doctors and the law. This event in the story highlights the cultural and linguistic barriers faced by Aya, as well as the complex dynamics between Native American communities and the outside authorities who often do not fully understand or respect their way of life. 7. What does Aya, as a mother, feel while being separated from her children? Aya, as a mother, feels a profound and agonizing sense of loss and heartbreak when she is separated from her children. The experience is emotionally devastating for her, and she grapples with a mixture of grief, helplessness, and anger. When Aya sees her children being taken away by the doctors and the BIA policemen, she is overcome with fear and desperation. She understands on a deep maternal level that her children are being forcibly taken from her, and she realizes that she may not see them again. This realization intensifies her sense of panic and sorrow. As Aya flees to the hills with Danny and Ella, she clings to them, trying to provide them with comfort and protection. She holds Ella close to her and carries Danny, determined to keep them safe from the strangers who are trying to separate them. In this moment, Aya's maternal instincts kick in, and she is willing to do whatever it takes to shield her children from harm. Throughout the ordeal, Aya's love for her children shines through. She feels a profound connection to them, and the thought of being separated from them is almost unbearable. This experience leaves a lasting scar on Aya's heart, and it becomes a pivotal and tragic moment in her life. 8. What are Aya's feelings when she meets her children after a long separation? When Aya meets her children after a long separation, she experiences a complex mix of emotions that range from joy and relief to sadness and a sense of disconnection. Seeing her children again fills Aya with a deep sense of longing and nostalgia. She is overjoyed to be reunited with them, and the sight of their familiar faces brings her a profound sense of comfort. The connection she feels with them is evident in the way she holds Ella close and interacts with Danny. She cherishes this moment, savoring the opportunity to be with them again. However, Aya also senses a subtle shift in their relationship. 
she notices that Danny struggles to communicate with her, speaking in a mix of English and Navajo. This linguistic barrier underscores the cultural divide that has grown between them during their separation. Aya feels a pang of sadness and realizes that, in some ways, they have become strangers to each other. Despite this sense of disconnection, Aya is determined to make the most of their time together. She engages with them, smiling at Ella and speaking to Danny. She tries to bridge the gap that has formed between them, holding onto the hope that their bond can be rekindled. Overall, Aya's emotions upon reuniting with her children are bittersweet. While she revels in the joy of their presence, she is also acutely aware of the challenges they face in rebuilding their relationship after the long separation. 9. Who is the blonde woman in the story and why does she feel uncomfortable at Aya's Hogan? The blonde woman in the st story is one of the white doctors who come to Aya's Hogan to take Danny and Ella. She feels uncomfortable at Aya's Hogan for several reasons. Firstly, the Hogan represents a stark contrast to the environment the blonde woman is likely accustomed to. It is a traditional Navajo dwelling, made of logs and mud, with a dirt floor. The simplicity and rustic nature of the Hogan may be unfamiliar, and perhaps even uncomfortable for someone not accustomed to this way of life. Secondly, the interior of the Hogan may have seemed foreign and potentially intimidating to the blonde woman. The presence of dried venison hanging from the ceiling, a practice common in Native American culture, could be perceived as unusual or even unsettling for someone from a different cultural background. Additionally, the language barrier may have contributed to the blonde woman's discomfort. She likely struggled to communicate effectively with Aya and her family, as they primarily spoke Navajo. This linguistic divide could have created a sense of unease or awkwardness for the blonde woman. Overall, the blonde woman's discomfort at Aya's Hogan likely stems from a combination of cultural differences, unfamiliar surroundings, and challenges in communication, all of which contributed to her feeling out of place in that particular environment. 10. Why are the men at the bar afraid of Aya? The men at the bar are afraid of Aya for several reasons, primarily stemming from cultural differences and prejudices. Firstly, Aya is a Native American woman, and the bar's patrons are predominantly white. In many parts of the United States, especially during the time period in which the story is set, there was a significant racial divide and prejudice against Native Americans. This racial tension could contribute to the fear and apprehension the white men feel towards Aya. Secondly, Aya's appearance may be striking and unfamiliar to the men. She is described as an old Navajo woman, which could make her stand out in a predominantly white environment. Her traditional clothing, demeanor, and possibly her language could all contribute to the men's unease. Additionally, Aya's demeanor and actions in the bar may not align with the behavior the men expect to encounter. She enters the bar purposefully, and her determined search for Chato may come across as assertive or even confrontational to the men. Overall, the fear of Aya exhibited by the men at the bar likely arises from a combination of racial prejudice, cultural differences, and Aya's assertive demeanor, which all contribute to a sense of unease or discomfort among the white patrons. 11. How does Chato spend his charity money? Chato spends the charity money they receive from the government on wine. When the monthly pale blue check arrives in a government envelope, Chato cashes it at the bar. Unfortunately, instead of using the money for necessary expenses or provisions, Chato chooses to spend it on alcohol. This habit leads to a cycle of dependency and financial instability for Aya and Chato. Aya's frustration with Chato's spending habits is evident in the story. She resents that the money, meant to provide for their basic needs, is squandered on alcohol. This behavior further strains their already difficult circumstances, especially considering the challenging environmental conditions they face, such as a lack of rain and struggling crops. Chato's choice to prioritize alcohol over their basic needs showcases a form of self-destructive behavior, which ultimately exacerbates their hardships. It also adds to Aya's feelings of isolation and frustration within their relationship. Overall, Chato's misuse of the charity money reflects a destructive pattern, that further contributes to the challenges faced by Aya and Chato in the story. See, long questions. 1. What is the, the significance of the setting in the story? 
the setting in Lullaby by Leslie Marmon Silco holds great significance as it plays a crucial role in shaping the themes and character dynamics within the story. The narrative unfolds in the arid, desolate landscape of the Laguna Pueblo community in New Mexico. This setting is not merely a backdrop, but an integral part of the story's atmosphere and the character's experiences. Firstly, the harsh desert environment reflects the difficult life that Aya and Chato lead. The barren land, struggling crops, and scarcity of resources symbolize the challenges they face in their daily lives. The arid setting serves as a metaphor for the emotional and cultural drought experienced by Native Americans as they grapple with the legacy of colonialism and oppression. The Cartonwood Tree and Sebaleta Creek also hold special significance. The tree provides Aya with a sense of comfort and familiarity, serving as a place of refuge where she can reminisce and find solace. The creek, while dry in the summer, represents the potential for renewal and sustenance in a land marked by scarcity. It is a reminder of the cycles of nature and the resilience required to survive in such an environment. Furthermore, the snowstorm that envelopes the landscape adds depth to the story's themes. The snow becomes a powerful symbol of memory and cultural preservation. Aya's recollections are triggered by the snow, and it serves as a medium through which she connects with her past and her ancestors. The snow also highlights the contrast between the purity of Aya's memories and the harsh reality of her present circumstances. Overall, the setting of Lullaby is not merely a backdrop, but a dynamic force that influences the character's experiences and shapes the story's themes. The arid desert landscape, the cartonwood tree, Sebaleta, Sebaleta Creek, and the snowstorm all contribute to the rich symbolism and emotional resonance of the narrative. 2. White man's talk, was a phrase that remained in circulation among Indian communities of the Americas after the Europeans' arrival in the continent. What role does this phrase play in this story? In Lullaby, by Leslie Marmon Silco, the phrase, white man's talk, holds significant thematic importance. It is a recurring motif that reflects the cultural clash between Native American and white settler communities, as well as the enduring impact of colonialism on Native American lives. The phrase, white man's talk, encapsulates the imposition of European language and culture on indigenous communities. It represents the dominance of English and other European languages over the native languages of the Navajo people. This linguistic shift is symbolic of the broader cultural assimilation and erasure that Native American communities experienced under colonial rule. Moreover, white man's talk also serves as a metaphor for the imposition of Western values, beliefs, and systems on indigenous ways of life. The intrusion of white culture disrupts the traditional practices and knowledge systems of Aya's community. It creates a sense of displacement and alienation, as they are forced to adapt to foreign norms. In the story, Aya's difficulty with English, coupled with her husband Chato's fluency, highlights the divide between generations and the struggle to navigate the complexities of living in a world dominated by white man's talk. Aya's reluctance to fully embrace the language reflects a resistance to the cultural erasure it represents. Furthermore, the phrase also conveys a sense of mistrust and skepticism towards the intentions and actions of white individuals, especially those in positions of authority. This sentiment is evident when Aya recalls the visit from white doctors who pressure her to sign papers. Her apprehension and fear stem from a long history of exploitation and mistreatment at the hands of white settlers and authorities. Overall, white man's talk in Lullaby serves as a potent symbol of the cultural and linguistic imperialism that Native American communities endured during the colonial era. It encapsulates the ongoing struggle for cultural preservation and the resilience of indigenous identity in the face of systemic oppression. 3. How does Silco portray class differences in the story? In Lullaby, by Leslie Marmon Silco, class differences are subtly portrayed through various elements of the narrative. The story highlights the socio-economic disparities between the Native American characters, like Aya and Chato, and the white settlers or authorities they interact with. Firstly, Aya's family's living conditions in the boxcar shack on the rancher's land signify their economic struggles. The description of the shack as a roughly built cabin, with a rusted and crooked stove pipe contrasts sharply with the more comfortable and well-maintained dwellings of the white rancher and his family. This discrepancy in living conditions emphasizes the economic disparity between the two groups. 
Chato's employment as a ranch hand further underscores the class divide. Despite his loyalty and years of hard work, the white rancher dismisses him. Him, highlighting the unequal power dynamics between the landowner and the laborer. This event ultimately leads to Chato's illness and further financial strain on Aya's family. Additionally, the reliance on government assistance, as seen in the monthly check that comes in a government envelope, points to their economic dependency. This contrasts with the white community's presumably more stable economic situation, as they do not appear to rely on such assistance. The class differences also manifest in the interactions between Aya and the white doctors who come to take her children. The doctor's authority and assertiveness reflect their position of privilege and power. They pressure Aya to sign papers, further illustrating the imbalance of power between the two groups. Overall, Silco portrays class differences through the stark contrast in living conditions, economic stability, and power dynamics between the Native American characters and the white settlers or authorities. These elements serve to underscore the systemic inequalities faced by Aya and Chato's family as a result of their marginalized socioeconomic status. 4. Silco's storytelling style is different from other short story writers. Comment on her storytelling style. Leslie Marman Silco's storytelling style in Lullaby is distinct and notable for several reasons. Her narrative approach incorporates traditional Native American storytelling techniques while also integrating modern literary elements. Here are some key aspects of Silco's storytelling style. Oral tradition influence, Silco draws on the oral storytelling traditions of Native American cultures. Her prose often carries a rhythmic quality, reminiscent of the way stories are passed down orally. This rhythmic flow aids in immersing the reader in the cultural and emotional landscape of the characters. Cultural specificity, Silco infuses her writing with specific cultural references and practices of the Laguna Pueblo community, where she herself hails from. These details provide authenticity and de depth to the narrative, allowing readers to gain insight into the customs and beliefs of the characters. Intertwining of past and present, Silco seamlessly weaves together past memories and present experiences. This interplay between different temporal planes creates a layered narrative structure, allowing the reader to understand the characters' histories and the impact on their current lives. Symbolism and metaphor, Silco employs rich symbolism and metaphor throughout the story. For example, the image of the cartonwood tree represents endurance and the cyclical nature of life. The old army blanket becomes a symbol of comfort and connection to her son Jimmy. Nature as a character, nature plays a significant role in Silco's storytelling. The descriptions of the natural landscape serve as a backdrop for the character's experiences and emotions. The weather and surroundings mirror the character's inner states, creating a sense of unity between the human and natural worlds. Stream of Consciousness, Silco employs a stream of consciousness narrative technique at times. This allows readers to enter Aya's inner thoughts and emotions, providing insight into her perspective and experiences. Sparse dialogue, the story is characterized by minimal dialogue. Instead, Silco often conveys communication through actions, memories, and internal reflections. This allows for a deeper exploration of the characters' inner lives. Cultural dissonance, Silco addresses the clash between Native American and white cultures. This theme is woven into the narrative through Aya's memories, interactions with white authorities, and reflections on her children's experiences. Overall, Leslie Marman Silco's storytelling style is characterized by its immersive, culturally specific, and emotionally resonant narrative techniques. Through her unique approach, Silco invites readers into the complex world of her characters, while also shedding light on broader cultural and societal themes. 5. What is it is the significance of the lullaby song that Aya sings to her husband at the end of the story. The lullaby song that Aya sings to her husband at the end of the story holds significant cultural and emotional resonance. Here are several aspects of its significance. Cultural continuity, the lullaby song represents a cultural continuum. By singing this traditional Navajo lullaby, Aya is passing down a piece of her cultural heritage to her husband. This act serves as a form of cultural preservation and a reminder of their shared roots. Symbol of comfort, the lullaby is a source of comfort for Aya and her husband. 
In the face of their struggles and hardships, the song provides solace and a sense of connection to something larger than themselves. It offers a moment of respite from their challenges. Expression of love, the act of singing a lullaby is a deeply intimate gesture, often associated with parental love and care. In this context, Aya's singing conveys her affection and concern for her husband. It is a way for her to express her emotions, particularly in a relationship that has experienced strain. Connection to children, the lullaby serves as a bridge to Aya's memories of her children. Through the act of singing, she brings her absent children closer in spirit, evoking the nurturing bond between a mother and her offspring. It allows her to feel their presence in a symbolic way. Resistance to oppression, in a broader context, the lullaby can be seen as an act of resistance against the oppressive forces that have impacted Aya and her family. It is a means of asserting her cultural identity and maintaining a sense of agency in the face of adversity. Healing and Reconciliation the lullaby holds the potential for healing and reconciliation. Through this shared moment, Aya and her husband may find a sense of unity and mutual understanding. It can be a step towards mending their relationship and finding solace together. Narrative closure. Closure, the lullaby song serves as a poignant conclusion to the story. It encapsulates the themes of memory, cultural resilience, and the enduring power of love. It leaves the reader with a sense of the emotional depth and complexity of Aya's experiences. Overall, the lullaby song in the story serves as a powerful symbol of cultural continuity, love, and resistance, providing a profound and resonant conclusion to Aya's narrative. 6. Silco has characterized Chato and Aya quite differently. Don't you think she seems biased towards her male character? Give reasons. While Silco presents both Chato and Aya as distinct characters in the story, it's important to recognize that the narrative may provide more insight into Aya's perspective due to its first-person point of view. This narrative choice may give the impression of a stronger focus on Aya's experiences and emotions. However, it does not necessarily imply bias towards Chato. Here are a few considerations. Narrative perspective, the story is narrated from Aya's point of view. This means that the reader gains direct access to Aya's thoughts, feelings, and memories. It allows for a deeper exploration of Aya's character and experiences. As a result, the reader may perceive a greater emphasis on Aya's perspective, but it doesn't necessarily imply bias against Chato. Exploration of maternal love, the narrative delves deeply into Aya's experiences as a mother, particularly in the context of her memories of her children. This focus on Aya's maternal love, and her emotional responses to the separation from her children may naturally lead to a more detailed portrayal of her character. Impact of loss and grief, Aya's character is shaped significantly by the loss of her children and the grief she experiences. This emotional core of the story naturally places Aya at the forefront of the narrative. The portrayal of Chato, while present and significant, may be secondary to Aya's internal journey. Cultural and gender dynamics, the story also explores the impact of cultural and gender dynamics on Aya's life. Her experiences as a Native American woman, particularly in the face of colonialism and loss, form a central theme. This focus on Aya's experiences doesn't necessarily diminish Chato's importance but reflects the narrative's thematic priorities. In conclusion, while the narrative provides a detailed and emotive portrayal of Aya's character, it does not necessarily imply bias against Chato. Instead, it reflects Silco's storytelling choices and the thematic emphasis on Aya's experiences as a mother, and a Native American woman facing cultural challenges and loss. Best of luck.